Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Euractiv's event supported by Demotech on participatory budgeting. How can it strengthen democracy and empower communities in the EU? Today, we discuss this innovative democracy tool that is becoming more and more common across Europe. For those of you who are not familiar with the topic, participatory budgeting, also known as PB, is when citizens get a say on how to spend a part of the local budget. They are called to propose and vote on initiatives, which are then implemented by the local government. According to the Participatory Budgeting World Atlas, there are over 4,000 PB processes in Europe, especially concentrated in Portugal and Poland. While the practice is more common at the local level, there are some interesting cases at national level, and today we will look at whether PB could work at EU level as well. And of course, we will also discuss the pros and cons of PB and its impact on civic participation. So let me introduce the panelists of our debate. We have Andrea Erte, Policy Analyst for Innovation in Government, Democracy and European Values at DGRTD, the European Commission. Helmut Scholz, Member of the European Parliament. Philipp von Brockdorf, Member of the European Economic and Social Committee in the Section for Employment, Social Affairs and Citizenship. Elisa Di Roni, Program Director at the European Citizen Action Service, Giovanni Allegretti, Senior Researcher at the Center for Social Studies of the Univers University of Coimbra. Welcome to you all. Before we start, let me give you an outline of our debate today. We will start with some short introductory remarks and then continue with some open questions. I would like to ask our audience to send in their questions as well, starting now through the Slido chat. Please also mention your name and position when you submit your question, so we have a little bit of context as well. And if you want, you can specify the panelists you want to ask your question to. I will now give the floor to our panelists uh, for a quick round of introduction. You have one minute each to introduce yourselves uh, to our audience and explain the most important point uh, that you want to get across uh, today. Andrea, let's start with you. Uh, good morning and thank you. Welcome to everybody who's participating in today's session and to the panelists and the organizers. Um, I would I may start with uh, by saying that there are many different processes currently that we name participatory budgeting. And that starts from a very basic online voting on already defined projects that people can vote on or to real, real deliberations from collecting ideas, debating the options, making decisions and transforming those ideas into projects and even the possibility to follow up and get really involved in the implementation of the projects as they do very often, especially in the city of Paris, for instance. And it's the letter that I would kind of really consider a great tool that has a huge potential to make a difference in the democratic space. It is much more about involving citizens and making in, in making decisions and not only informing them after we have spent the budget. It's not a one of communication gig or a campaign stunt. It's how we start working with citizens in the long run. And I would even extend this to stakeholders and how we work with stakeholders in the long run for policymaking purposes. Um, in the applications that I work for the Research and Innovation Service of the European Commission, and I'm also um, leading a matrix team in our service that is building capacity for participation and training colleagues of how to work with participation across silos internally and with stakeholders in um, our policy development uh, attempts and processes. And in the applications in my service is also managing the European Capital of Innovation Awards. And in the applications submitted for the awards, we can see a lot of brilliant ideas from different capitals and other light cities across Europe for engaging with the residents and uh, local, what we call the innovation ecosystem players who are also citizens, but they come from different types of stakeholder groups like the, the government and its authorities, the industry and business uh, related to the field we are talking of the scientific community and also the organized civil society and citizens in general. And they collectively envision a desirable future and redesign the city for sustainable living, the way people travel within the city, manage waste or the drinking water, how to heat uh, collective housing um, or organize public spaces. And this is launching large-scale experiment um, 
and uh, much more than just participatory budgeting and voting and asking citizens what to spend the budget on. So it's not only um, advice, but it is much more hands-on engagement and it's a long-term engagement. It's how the city starts working with the, the citizens in within the boundaries. So I consider participatory budgeting a great first step to start engaging with citizens, but there is a whole new world beyond participatory budgeting that ensures um, intensive engagement of citizens in much more the co-creation of a better future from getting to collecting the first ideas through deliberations to hands-on very concrete action that they can do together. And that is what I consider to be very powerful, a real participatory democracy in live action. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Helmut, uh, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you for having invited me to this, to participate in this very, I think, challenging, interesting and up-to-date um, discussion. Um, I would add maybe two or three uh, ideas already presented by Andrea just now. But first of all, let me stress that uh, the need to fully engage citizens in the decision making at all levels of the EU, so from the municipalities up to the European Union, is in order to enhance the uh, legitimacy of the European Union and increase public trust in the work of the institutions. And then we have to be very concrete and precise. Uh, participatory budgeting is not yet a citizen's budget. And the question how we are establishing a link between these two um, uh, forms of participatory mechanisms um, that uh, maybe are complementary to the well-known and existing other forms of participatory democracy like the European Citizens Initiative uh, or citizens' assemblies or uh, citizens' dialogues, uh, what we have experienced in a really persuading way in the conference on the future of Europe. Um, the last two years. Um, I think this is important. And the question of the participatory budgeting is just um, going beyond this, how to say, dialogue, etc. We want that, and me personally, because I have introduced an in initiative report in the European Parliament, which was adopted by a great and big majority uh, in the plenary last year. And uh, in this uh, reporting, we have said that participatory budgeting could be an additional mechanism and tool where we are discussing the questions how and where we want to spend money. And that is not only true for a municipality when we are discussing how um, the, 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 the money should be given for infrastructure uh, projects, for kindergarten, for, for the schools, etc. But that must be developed in a more broader understanding how this local participatory budgeting process should be embedded in the, in the regional and the national and probably also in the European wide um, debates, how we want to spend the money. And that I think is a challenging moment in particular in the moment where we are now, uh, now in, uh, in the development of European policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip? Thank you. Um, well, I, I, as an economist, I, I see a, a lot of relevance in participatory budgeting. And uh, if we are moving towards a more sustainable economic growth model, then PB can actually facilitate the path towards, towards this, this growth model. Why? Because actually it can actually, it can facilitate um, effective and effective and efficient decisions in terms of how resources are allocated. So clearly this would support the European Union ambition towards a more sustainable economic growth path. Of course, we need to increase participation in PB. And uh, you mentioned, of course, that there are 4,000 examples uh, with Portugal and Poland primarily being the, the countries where this process is very, very popular, but it's not enough. We need to increase this, this, this activity across the European Union. And to do so, in my view, we need um, a framework, a model, which can actually be replicated in countries where PB is currently not in place. Um, what is also relevant, of course, is that we extend 
the local participation, local PB, towards a more national and, of course, uh, at EU level as well. But as I said, it's very important that we have a model which can actually be uh, replicated across the European Union because I think this would serve as a guide towards countries, to countries, members of the European Union that currently are not so much actively involved in PB. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Elisa. Yes, um, thank you very much for inviting me here to this interesting debate. So I'm Elisa, I work for the European Citizen Action Service, which is an NGO based here in Brussels. And for, for almost a decade, my expertise has been on digital democracy. So really the potential and challenges of uh, using ICT to enhance democratic institutions and the relationship between citizens and their policymakers. So uh, I've been um, researching and implementing projects around many different types of channels for participatory democracy. And of course, participatory budgeting is only one of the channels that are existing. Um, I would like to just maybe state uh, as um, in, the, in the beginning that I think that the added value of participatory budgeting is the fact that even though usually you use maybe a small investment budget to allow citizens to, to make decision making, um, it is much more concrete uh, than other types of participatory democracy practices. So it ranks really, really high on the participation ladder as it is one of the few participatory democracy processes that really empowers citizens to actually take decisions. And there is often very, very concrete impact that citizens are happy to see in, in these processes. And it requires a significant commitment also from local, national and European level to actually implement these sort of processes. And this is a, a, a strong signal uh, usually from, uh, you know, policymakers that they actually want the collaboration of citizens, which is for citizens also a very motivating um, reason to join participatory democracy processes. And um, at the European level, um, this hasn't been done yet. And what we've been advocating for is maybe to start off with a, a pilot project in order to test out participatory um, budgeting at the EU level. Um, and I think that it is uh, certainly a, a very strong uh, message for, for citizens that the EU wants to empower them. But at the same time, I'm also very cautious of the possible challenges at the EU level, because we've seen with other uh, sorts of channels, such as the European Citizens Initiative, uh, the consultation processes, and even the Conference on the Future of Europe, and now the Citizens Panel, that at the EU level, there might be more challenges um, compared to the local level where participatory budgeting is mainly used. So, yes, I look forward to the debate on this. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and Giovanni. Good morning, everybody. Um, in uh, my case, uh, I had the opportunity um, last year uh, to sign for the United Nations uh, the strategy uh, guidance note uh, on participatory budgeting. And this was a, a great opportunity for me for uh, um, giving a, a look around, an overview, having an overview of different levels of participatory budgeting in the world and i think uh, that uh, in this moment i i would like today to uh, focus on uh, what is the the path the way toward which uh, uh, pb must go through in order to scale up at other levels in this moment there are uh, countries which are starting a process of uh, participatory budgeting at national level uh, like brazil and i think uh, um, this path is very important uh, uh, for uh, uh, imagining a level like the European one for uh, uh, the main uh, concept uh, uh, of participatory budgeting, try to um, have a, 
a, a process of cross fertilization and hybridization with other typologies of participatory process, also in order to overcome his structural limits that exist, even if they uh, normally are not put uh, uh, in, in, in front of the discussion on PB, because uh, the value of uh, its functioning uh, uh, are very important. But uh, it's important to remember also uh, which are the structural limits of this type of participation and, and try to see how to cross fertilize it uh, and uh, insert into systems of multi channel participation in order uh, to make uh, uh, the best of uh, his possible effects. Thank you. Um, so let's move to, to the first question. And uh, actually, I will ask the first question to, to Giovanni. Um, could, you, uh, could you maybe give us a, a quick overview of PB processes in Europe um, and explain at what level of government they are usually, um, they are usually used uh, and what are the, their most common features? Uh, first of all, I think that we, we must remember that participatory budgeting, as was said by, by the colleague Andrea before, uh, it's a family of different processes whose core is uh, um, the fact that uh, usually uh, the financial issue is is used as a gatekeeper in participatory processes. So in order to discuss with people about dreams and possibilities, and then uh, uh, the money arrives, and in, in many cases uh, for saying, oh, sorry, it's a very good idea, but there is no money for that. So in participatory budgeting, uh, the, the thing was works uh, the other way around. Money is an important each input at the beginning of the process in order that people are fully aware of uh, uh, what is possible to do uh, inside that uh, pot of money, or they can even help, and this happened in many, uh, in many countries, especially the, the, the poorest one, uh, can help to, to imagine uh, different ways to uh, gain additional funding also through um, parts of uh, uh, in-kind resources arriving for the same participants. And uh, these elements uh, of obviously um, can, can, can make us see that participatory budgeting can be symbolic or full. So going to Europe, uh, um, among the, the European processes, uh, there are some uh, that are uh, uh, processes which gives more than 10, 20 euros per inhabitants of the city. This especially happens in, in, in big cities, but also some smaller cities uh, have uh, uh, quite significant resources at disposal available for participatory budgeting. Uh, a participatory budgeting of symbolic type, it's a, a process uh, that uh, usually uh, put at stake uh, a reduced uh, amount of money. This happens especially uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, youth participatory budgeting, which has a very interesting pedagogic uh, aspect because they are used to, to build the, the, the uh, active city citizenship idea uh, together with youth. But uh, we have to remember that in this moment, participatory budgeting, uh, especially in Europe, is extending beyond the idea that this is a tool for uh, administrative institution, because we have uh, um, uh, professional ranks, for example, order of psychologists, uh, architects, uh, um, uh, accountants, uh, nurses in Portugal that are doing participatory budgeting inside inside their own uh, resources then we have uh, schools and university an interesting case is that of the university of malaga that is uh, uh, doing participatory budgeting start it started in the department of psychology about diversity and uh, uh, the, the 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 value in uh, of uh, of uh, campaigns to construct identity and also uh, sexual and gender identity uh, uh, that's uh, it's it, it's a quite an interesting use of participatory budgeting within different typologies of, uh, of institution. The, the case of Portugal is one of the cases in which participatory budgeting tried to go uh, at national uh, level. And uh, this was an experiment in 2017 and 18. It was stopped to restructure it because uh, possibly one of the difficulty was the articulation with the system of the techno bureaucracy of the ministries. And the result 
results uh, that came out from this discussion of the limits of that experiment uh, uh, was a decree, uh, decree 130 of 2021, that imagined a sort of multi-level governance uh, of participatory budgeting, which is a quite interesting concept in order also to reduce uh, the, the burden that uh, having many PBs in the same territories at different territorial level could be for the citizens. So I think that this uh, these indications show us that there are possibilities and there are possibilities also opened by legislation. So uh, ruling documents uh, which are dealing with participatory budgeting in different places. In Europe, we have a characteristic very different from the rest of the world. In many other continents, uh, there are laws that oblige uh, uh, local authorities, for example, uh, from uh, starting from a national level to do participatory budgeting, like the case of Peru, Dominican Republic, for example. In Europe, uh, and the case of Poland that you quoted before is one of them, there are mainly laws that uh, incentivize, now incentivize participatory budgeting uh, through, for example, uh, uh, support in terms of resources by the national state uh, or by regional government. Uh, Italy has five laws uh, that help participation for region, from uh, regional level, and some of them, like the Sicilian one, are really concentrated on uh, producing a larger number of uh, of participatory budgeting. I finalize saying that uh, a dimension very important in Europe in this moment uh, is becoming the creation of multi-channel system in which participatory budgeting is an articulation for other typologies of participatory process uh, with different type of audiences. For example, the case of Cascais, Grenoble, and even uh, Barcelona, which is uh, has been named the capital of European democracy this year, uh, are very important uh, in this attempt. Uh, I'm personally working in Bologna as a guarantor of participatory budgeting for the mayor office, together with the, uh, with the colleague Giulia Allegrini, Allegretti and Allegrini, maybe, maybe Bologna uh, pointed to, to happiness in the surname of the guarantor. But it's important because we are trying to build this system, look into all the other participatory process and um, trying to act in a way that uh, what is proposed in participatory budgeting could have new legs also in other processes and interact with them. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, for this uh, overview. Um, so we see that PB processes are growing across uh, Europe. You also mentioned uh, youth participatory processes, participatory processes, um, participatory budgeting processes in uh, universities and schools. Um, Elisa, uh, why do you think this um, uh, PB tool is becoming more and more uh, popular? Is there a gap, a specific gap that, that is filling? Thank you very much, Silvia, for the question. Um, yes, I definitely think that there are several reasons why we've seen in the last, I would say, let's say 15 years, I wouldn't even say only a decade, I would say around 15 years, that we've seen a really um, increase, uh, an increase of participatory democracy processes. And as I said, there are several reasons. And I can name you some examples of other participatory democracy processes that have um, that we've seen. For example, after um, the economic crisis in around 2008, uh, the ice, um, let's say that uh, Iceland was thinking about how to get back trust from its citizens who were very skeptical about the government and how they were running things through this economic crisis. What did they do? They basically started the uh, revision of their constitution through a crowdsourcing process. So I would say that sometimes these participatory democracy processes are actually um, emerging because there are certain top-down decisions that are made and um, institutions and policymakers want to try to gain back the trust of citizens that they have lost. Um, another interesting example that I can mention is that sometimes it doesn't come from a specific crisis but there's a more of a bottom up process. So for example, civil society organizations think that um, you know, policymaking is not transparent enough, that citizens should participate more. And this can be, for example, the case of Latvia in which uh, Manabalstop LV, who is an, is an NGO, 
they actually manage to play a significant role in changing how legislative procedures are organized. And now it is basically um, something embedded in their institutions to do e-initiatives. So this is also very interesting to see how sometimes it's top down, sometimes it's bottom up. Then we've also seen recently also, you know, how Macron uh, a few years ago started the European citizens consultation processes. He basically also used his, you know, his, um, his position to put himself as a front runner to bring um, the European debate to citizens. And I think that this was really interesting and also how it also led afterwards to um, uh, President von der Leyen proposing the Conference on the Future of Europe. And now we actually have citizens panels to actually, you know, um, communicate Europe much more to citizens uh, that maybe were not really aware of the issues at the EU level before uh, these processes. So there are many reasons why participatory um, democracy processes are emerging like this. And uh, I would also say that um, what we've seen in the past decade in our political party system is that we've seen the rise of also, let's say, populist movements. And populist movements such as in Italy and Spain have been using participatory democracy processes very often in order to connect more with their citizens. That's actually sometimes the, the argument that they use that traditional politics does not um, do not um, take into consideration citizens in decision making processes. So how do we do it? For example, in Italy, the five star movement used the pl platform Rousseau in order to connect more with citizens and get them to decide on things. So I think that that actually led to also um, more traditional parties opening up their mind and thinking, OK, um, we need to also start updating a bit how we take decisions. So let's start using also those types of tools for citizen participation. And I think that this is very interesting. And one other thing that I would like to mention is that we've seen a bit of a decline in the interest in representative traditional democracy in the sense that we've been seeing less people going tur turning up at elections and especially young people. So why is it that young people are not attractive to this type of representative democracy? There are many reasons. Um, and we've also seen a decline in party membership. So I think that, you know, politicians are thinking of ways also to reach out to certain target groups, such as young people in our society, because sometimes they might not go to vote, but this doesn't mean that they're not interested in politics. They might be just interested in, for example, on specific topics, such as environmental issues. And on those topics, young people are very, very active. So how can we make sure that our democracy is more inclusive in that sense? And one way I would say that politicians have found is to start opening up their decision making processes much more by using different channels and means in which they can interact more with their citizens. And this has shown in research that these types of processes can bring a better learning curve. So more civic education, it can enhance legitimacy and trust of people in institutions. And as I said, also reach out to target groups that might not be interested in representative democracy as such, uh, such as young people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elisa. Very interesting point on the populist movement um, using participatory tools uh, as well. Um, uh, Philip, um, looking at the government's uh, side, what would you say is the benefit of implementing PP processes? Um, does it increase transparency and legitimacy? Well, yes, I think uh, PB helps to increase transparency in terms of allowing citizens, obviously, to participate effectively and directly in decision making. Because PB, first and foremost, is not just about consultation, which is actually the, the one, you know, consultation is mainly at, at uh, social partners, civil society level. Here we're looking at a process which involves effective participation in decision taking, which is more than merely consultation. It is an opportunity. Um, we are actually going through a phase at the moment, obviously, which is obviously the green transition, but also digitalization, which actually, uh, particularly the green transition, concerns uh, citizens directly. 
it impacts them directly. And the PB actually can be a vehicle for, for the expression of concerns, a, a voice for expressing concerns uh, in terms of how this green transition impacts on citizens at community level and obviously at also at regional and national level. In fact, I would say that, that uh, PB um, provides, as I said, this opportunity because the green transition, which is supported by two funds, European Union funds, the Just Transition Fund and the Climate so Social Fund, um, which are important to support the transition, but they're not enough. Clearly, local resources, national resources are required to help smoothen this transition and participatory budgeting can actually be the vehicle for ensuring that resources, financial resources, are decided and have an effect at the local level where this transition will impact directly on citizens. So clearly, I think this is an opportunity here. Having said that, um, it's important, obviously, to, keep, to manage expectations uh, because clearly everything for, uh, is centered around a budget, uh, a limited budget, which obviously has to then, then uh, be decided in terms of how it is going to be implemented at local level or even at regional and national level. Uh, but it's important, as I said, to manage expectations because all everything centers, centers around the budget, which then obviously has to be decided through a participatory, participatory budgetary process. Having said that, as I said, in order to ensure or enhance the effectiveness of how resources are allocated, participatory budget is certainly an important vehicle towards that direction. Well, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, and also thank you for mentioning digitalization. We might come back to, to that uh, and the use of digital uh, tools, digital platforms uh, for participatory processes later on. Um, now, we, we talked uh, a lot on uh, of the local, regional, national level, um, but uh, let's move towards the European level. Um, Helmut, you were the rapporteur uh, of a Parliament's report on democracy and uh, citizen participation in 2020. Uh, where you called for an increased use of PB um, and uh, crowdsourcing um, at EU level. Why do you think it is important to foster PB processes uh, at the EU level and what benefits do you think uh, it would bring? Um, <clears throat> thank you for that question. Very, very interesting. I would say um, this report is the only real report adopted in the, by the plenary of the parliament as a majority, we are speaking concretely about the PB. And um, in other reports, uh, when we are discussing budgeting, etc., of course, the idea of the PB at the European Union level is not really shared by a lot of uh, members of the European Parliament. So uh, there is still a, a, a huge step to be done uh, to, to implement it really into, uh, into concrete findings and, and works, why it is so. And I think uh, I would go back to the to the um, idea what Elisa just said that um, we are speaking with the PB and with the de participant democracy about trust and distrust. And the example of the conference on the future is just showing where we discuss this issue with citizens uh, shows that if there is not a really scrutiny and follow-up process organized by the institutions, so that means by the Commission, by the Parliament, by the Council in particular, um, very, very often the ideas of the citizens are going into, what to say, it, in the, into the nirvana. So it is not picked up and implemented in concrete follow-up uh, decision-making of the, of the European Union. So therefore, I think it is very impl uh, important that we are saying the citizens' participatory mechanisms, including the PB, because the PB could be a very concrete field where citizens are seeing how their um, participation in decision making is really implemented. So that maybe is the most advanced and far reaching step in participatory democracy. And therefore, I am in favor of, of, of looking for experience in that uh, direction. And if you are honest, so for example, in Germany, um, a lot of the municipal 
uh, examples of um, um, of citizens' participation in in in, in, in PB um, aspects are linked to the voluntary means and possibilities of a of a municipality to decide. So that is even not in Germany linked to the real budgeting. So it's additional voluntary uh, decision making. And uh, where the investments are going, are they going into streets or are they going into, into the um, creation of new schools uh, with, with, uh, or for, for environmental issues to keep the trees uh, on the roads and not to make it more easy for, for vehicles to go through? being at uh, motor um, 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 uh, cars or being at bicycles. But the question is how we want to share a common view of the citizens on this at the municipal level and that to translate it to the European Union level is of course a real challenge. And we have to work on that because we here we have to introduce new new uh, tools and, um, and uh, forms of referendum where a dialogue is not enough. And that leads me to this second big issue. So it's not only trust and distrust, it's also the question about information. It's a question of how the policy at the European Union level is informing our citizens how we want to construct the budget, fulfilling the huge expectations of citizens that the EU must uh, be much more responsible and 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 um, and um, and inviting, inclusive for them to decide where the European Union should give the money um, in future for, for meeting the expectations. I think that that is uh, very important. And here I see uh, a huge range of, of, uh, of uh, necessary uh, increased discussions with scientists, uh, with, with the Commission, uh, with, the, uh, with the civil society. And here I hope that we can use the, the first report adopted on that uh, should be a starting point for this discussion. Thank you, Helmut. Um, and going to, to the Commission, Andrea, you bring the point of view of uh, the European Commission to the table. Um, do you see any space for a PB, for participatory budgeting at the EU level, uh, alongside uh, existing participatory tools such as the European Citizens Initiative or the Commission's uh, citizen panels? Is this something that the Commission is looking at or will look at in the near future? Thank you for the question. Um, I would think that uh, uh, open governance tools like uh, participatory budgeting work well when the government, whether it's a city level, a national level, uh, or a European level per se, is, is fully in charge of the initiative from the conception through the realization of the full management of it, the implementation of it, and the follow up of it, and where the citizens are done directly impacted by the decisions made that gives them an appetite and a more enthusiasm, motivation to get engaged. But in our system, in as a multi-level governance system in the European Union, there are quite a many layers of decision making and many players to follow the project through. So in our case, uh, and a little jokingly, I would say that it is the European Union member states, those democratically elected representatives of the countries who participate in the definition of the EU budget and all of, of the EU budget, not only part of it, but that's some kind of uh, saying that with a smile <laughs> on my face, but we cannot really move away from the representative democracy, uh, the system we're currently uh, working within that is defined by the treaties. Our efforts had been increased uh, drastically over the past couple of years um, to establish direct contact with citizens and to work much more meaningfully uh, with them beyond their elected officials we are working with when we are developing policies. And citizen engagement had become a, um, an important element in the work of especially my um, my service in the research and innovation, where under Horizon Europe Research and Innovation Funding Program, we have five 
um, missions at European level uh, to solve today's most pertinent uh, challenges like uh, finding a cure for cancer, cleaning the oceans, improving soil health and smart and sustainable cities, um, where a um, significant element of time and effort and resources went into consulting citizens or engaging better with citizens on what is um, the, the direction that uh, missions should take. Um, and as regards, for instance, the European Citizens Initiative, uh, if I am informed correctly, there had been so far 89 uh, registered uh, initiatives, but only six had actually reached the threshold of the 1 million signatures that has to be collected from a minimum of seven European Union member states. And then it gets submitted to the Commission for treatment or for a response. And this means there's a lot of effort that does not actually reach its objective. Um, and for the moment, the Commission is actually thinking about improving the situation and how to support better the citizens who are actually gathering the, the, the signatures to, to be able to launch and formalize those initiatives. And within days, uh, the European Democracy in Action Educational Toolkit will be launched, um, which is basically uh, addressing teachers in the last two years of secondary education, um, helping them teach young people to mobilize for a good cause um, and to how, how, that's, how that's to be done and how to be responsible citizens. So it's complementary to a civic education and working more concretely with the European tool uh, that is possible. Um, and also as regards to the Commission's citizens panels, uh, this new instrument that uh, our president uh, von der Leyen had announced uh, that become permanent tools or permanent uh, instruments for the EU decision-making following the Conference of the Future of Europe. Uh, the first one of which will um, we'll start working on food waste, for example, but it is something that is not yet a fully tested experience. Um, we are making attempts, but it is, um, as we've heard from the colleagues um, on the panel, the higher it gets, whether the more um, complex the system gets. And when we reach the national level, it's already becoming quite challenging, let alone in a multi-level governance system where there are many players. And also there are many diverse cultures. The, the citizens' uh, interest in one country might be different from another. Creating a representative sample of citizens who can make those informed decisions and also what would be the issue to decide where there is little technocratic knowledge necessary uh, for the citizens to make an informed decision on, um, which is uh, our legal system of what the boundaries are and what uh, you know, projects to establish at European level is all considerations that um, make it um, a, a complicated or even a complex uh, process at the European level. But as you see, um, I've quoted some of the some of the initiatives that we are taking to be much more in direct contact with the citizens of Europe. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. Um, Helmut, do you want to react to what was just said? Yeah, yeah I wanted to add maybe a, a, a small idea or a small problem which I see. So we are even not able in the European Union also after the Conference on the Future of Europe, to agree on a joint uh, common electoral law, which is really a European one. So not a 27 member states organized elections with national background, probably, on European elections. So that shows that the, 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 the multi-governance level, the multi-level governance in the European Union is not yet functioning in the way as citizens are expecting it. And so if the member states are continue only to see their national interest as a main narrative for their participation in this Staatenverbund construction of the European Union, we don't come further. So I see the PB as a possible tool where citizens can learn. And of course, it's a question about education, it's a question of information, it's a question of really organizing their, their possibility to participate together with representatives 
in the different levels to decide on where the money should go. And the conference had showed that the citizens quite well understand in which direction we want to, to develop the whole idea. And, and here I would say we should not speak only about the, the, the dialogue and forms. We should really speak about a, a fully engagement of citizens in the decision making. And that is important. And here also to, to discuss this problem in the council, with the commission, in the parliament, how to create. And the, the, the example from Portugal just showed us that uh, other member states probably will not take over the, the experience of Portugal in the national um, exp experiment or a form of a PB uh, to, to say that you must be horizontally organized. But we need this horizontally joint approach to this. And I hope we can find new solutions to that. Stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you actually mentioned uh, the role of communication and information. Um, of course, a big part of the of PB process is also related to uh, raising awareness around the process so that uh, citizens actually participate. Um, uh, Elisa, uh, what do you think are the, the challenges around um, communicating uh, PB processes uh, and engaging citizens? And I would like to uh, link this question also to some questions we received through uh, by our audience uh, through Slido. Um, we have one uh, um, uh, on, uh, um, they are both on digital platforms, so using digital platforms in PB processes. Um, how can they be used to strengthen democracy, um, engagement participation? Um, and uh, yeah, uh, someone uh, says, uh, I'm with Democracy Technologies, an online publication focusing on digital democracy tools. It would be great to hear more about the digital aspect of PB initiatives. So maybe Elisa, you can, uh, you can uh, tell us something about this. Okay, thanks for the questions. Um, I'll start with the one on communication. So we recently actually had last year a one year crowdsourcing process in 10 different cities on the topic of air quality. And uh, it was, um, even though we were kind of all like participatory democracy, e-democracy experts in our consortium, we still had a lot of challenges, especially when it came to communicating about the process. And I think that this is a general challenge that you can find in any process, including participatory budgeting. So I think that the main challenge is that often when people initiate either top down or bottom up these processes, human and financial resources are often overlooked when implementing these methods, especially when it comes to allocating certain budgets to reach out to people. Um, and we saw that um, we kind of underestimated also our own communication and what we like to call the marketing budget. And many times we really had to complement the online uh, reaching out with the offline. So meaning we really had to go on streets to talk to people directly to make them understand why it was important for them to contribute. And this requires, of course, not only financial resources, but also a lot of human resources. And sometimes I, what I see from my own experience is that there are very small teams maybe implementing certain high level um, participatory democracy um, processes. And they focus a lot on the content and um, it is important to also really focus on the outreach. Um, I think that uh, certain recommendations that came out from our own experience and in general from research is that if you use digital tools in order to reach out to people, these digital tools must be really, really user-friendly and simple. Um, so that citizens can understand very concretely what they're asked to do in these sort of processes. Another really important recommendation I would give is that not only you need to be clear about what you want from them, but also how these contributions will impact. Because we've had also a lot of citizens coming back to us saying, yeah, but why, why should I do this? You know, uh, what's it? Um, going to lead to in concrete terms of policy making. A third recommendation that I have is around how multipliers are crucial. So if you're doing something bottom up, of course, build on existing networks, creating collaboration with reputable um, organizations working on that topic, 
um, in, and also to have collaborations uh, between different levels. So I think that if any, in any case we want to have a participatory budgeting, for example, at the EU level, we need to ensure that the EU also gets on board the support um, in communication efforts from the local and from the national levels because the EU can't do this alone. The EU will need to have stakeholders on the spot to convince citizens of why um, participatory budgeting is important at that level. So I think the main question around communication to citizens is what are you offering? Um, why should anyone participate? Like what's in it for citizens? Why should they waste their time and effort to actually go through the participatory budgeting process? And secondly, to stakeholders and organizations and local authorities and municipalities, etc., why would anyone want to help you um, if you're doing this at the EU level? Why would you want those? So the, on the second question, on the role of digital platforms in participatory budgeting, definitely, I think, well, it's my expertise as well. Technology has the potential to make democracy more widespread and more efficient, provided that it is used properly and that it provides citizens with the right safeguards. So I'm talking about security issues, etc. And although the digital divide still exists, and this exists also for different reasons, for example, in rural areas, there's not good connection to the internet or digital skills are lacking because some parts of society have less digital education than others or also accessibility to technology may be difficult. For example, sometimes it doesn't take into account the needs uh, of people with disabilities. We still cannot deny that although this digital um, gap exists, that most people in Europe, they use their smartphone, not only to make calls and texts, but also to use them for functional purposes in their daily lives. And we see this also with more e-government services and more you know, the use of e-identity cards to sign anything nowadays. So I think that this is just going to increase in the year. So with participatory budgeting, it is important and it is mainly used, I would say, to use technology as a means for gathering citizens' contributions and for informing them also about how participatory budgeting um, works step by step and what's the impact that they're going to, uh, to make. So... In conclusion, I would just say that the thing is that when we have citizens assemblies that are offline or the Conference of the Future of Europe or other um, consultation processes that are on paper, um, well, meeting people offline for citizens panels is just very time consuming. I have been asked myself to participate in a consultation here in Belgium, and they asked me for five weekends of my time. Now, you can understand if you have small children, even if they give you a small remuneration or, you know, they say that they're going to take care of your kids. It's still for me just too difficult to commit five weekends of my time to actually participate in a citizens panel. It is impossible for me, especially because I don't have family here. So you always need to put yourself in the, the shoes of others and ask them and ask yourself, like, if this time is worth it for them, and how can you use the potential of technologies to make sure that people can participate wherever they are and whenever they are, and you can gather their contributions through tech in a much more efficient way um, compared to offline in this sense. Thank, thank you, Elisa. Uh, Giovanni, I will come to you uh, just in a second because I know that uh, Philip has to leave, so I will just give him um, a possibility to answer uh, one last question. Uh, maybe you want to react on this, on the use of uh, digital tools as well, um, and also uh, elaborate a little bit more on something that you mentioned during your introductory remark on a framework, a model to encourage the use uh, of PB where um, participatory budgeting is not yet uh, common. Oh, yes, let me start on the process of digitalization and how actually IT can support the process of PB. Um, as mentioned by Elise, obviously, IT is an important uh, infrastructure which can support this process. Having said that, I think there are clear differences across the European Union in terms of IT investment and infrastructure. So that doesn't help. 
uh, and we need more investment in the infrastructure to support this process. But there's no question that this is an important element in terms of uh, enhancing PP across the European Union. Let us not underestimate the, the, the question of digital divide. Uh, we cannot obviously disconnect from senior citizens who do not have actually, actually access to, to digitalization as, as younger cohorts of the population across the European Union. So again, that is something which we cannot underestimate. And in order to have effective um, PB part participatory budgeting, we need to involve all categories of the population, including and especially senior citizens and vulnerable groups. Um, and this is obviously is imperative if participatory budgeting is to be effective, as I, shall, as I said before. Um, in terms of having a framework or a model, I think this is particularly relevant uh, to encourage the, the setup and, and the smooth functioning of participatory bu uh, budgeting across the European Union. This, I think, is something where even the European Commission actually can support in terms of setting up or, or providing a, a model or a framework which, as I said before, can be replicated across the European Union. Uh, this is vital, in my view, if we are to, uh, to embark towards extending participatory budgeting beyond the countries where they already exist. Um, of course, there, there will be differences in terms of um, specific characteristics for particular countries. But a framework uh, providing a sort of a common setup uh, in terms of how uh, participatory budgeting can work, I think would help. Uh, it would help, obviously, and also ensure that participatory bu budgeting is clearly a tool towards effective decision making. As I mentioned before, it, this is not about consultation. It goes well beyond consultation. And we do have opportunities um, where we can actually apply participatory budgeting to, to go beyond the level of consultation. I mentioned before the issues of, of uh, green transition. I mentioned, of course, in particularly that uh, in 2027, emission trading will be extended towards transport and housing. And that's where precisely, I think, participatory budgeting can help towards effective decision making in terms of smoothing the transition towards the green transition. So clearly, we have um, a, a number of opportunities where participatory budgeting can be applied. But it is important that there is support in terms of the IT infrastructure and especially providing a model or a framework to support participatory budgeting across the European Union. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philippe, uh, very much for uh, being with us as well. Um, so, uh, Giovanni, you wanted to react to, to what Elisa was saying before? Yes, um, um, I, I think that Elisa said something uh, very strategic, which is that uh, in many cases, participatory processes are built uh, in a sort of organizer driven approach instead uh, of a participant approach. Uh, recently, the Association of Participatory Mayors of Portugal, RAP, um, did a study on underrepresented act in uh, participatory processes to understand if they were taking care enough of the diversity of participants, including the rich, the powerful, that in many cases are absentees from participatory process. As they realized that one of the reasons why they don't manage to reach uh, uh, a, a large diversity and they have like this uh, middle class audience uh, is because uh, uh, there is no process of co-design of the inclusive measure of participatory processes. See, this is not applying only to participatory budgeting. So um, there is a sort of standard uh, of organization that is centered in the bureaucratic division of the institution who proposed the, which proposed the participatory processes. And even the form of outreach air communications are not uh, enough tested. Um, some years ago in, a, in an Horizon project I coordinated uh, called Empathia on Platforms for Participation, um, uh, we tested an experience of co-design in Wuppertal in Germany. We 
which was very interesting because then uh, started modifying the model of participatory budgeting in many other cities of the network of uh, burger households in, in, in Germany. And uh, uh, it, in this co-design process, even the uh, uh, extent to which uh, the technologies were used were discussed with the uh, participants in the phase uh, of construction of the methodology. This was very important because uh, um, the municipality could realize uh, that for participant technology is very useful until a certain extent. And then uh, it becomes uh, a factor for reducing the complexity of the process or, or reducing, for example, to a simple sum of individual preferences, something that it was born, uh, I, I think about the origin of participatory budgeting in the 90s in Brazil, was born also as a space for constructing societal bonds, no? so a community uh, building place and uh, the the technologies are useful for the instrumental uh, um, uh, perspective so reaching for example a decision when you have several decisions possible or uh, deciding about investments instead of alternatives possibilities but is not a space for constructing societal bonds which are a very fundamental element in this moment i'm coordinating a, a an horizon uh, um, research and innovation process on the support of participation for environmental uh, decision making in the framework of the european green deal and is this clear here that participatory budgeting as, as a specific tool has some limits. The first limit is uh, that uh, it's, it's not structured around the long-term vision, so um, decision in, the envir in environmental terms uh, uh, need uh, uh, to be imagined in a, in a mid-long term perspective. And the other thing is that participatory budgeting tend to be competitive and many measure uh, for the environment has to be taken, have to be taken also in relation to a certain convergence of different people. So that's why it's very important to hybridize participatory budgeting with form of a mid or long term planning. Participatory budgeting certainly gives a dimension of action, no? So things will happen, uh, but uh, it concentrates too much, for example, on, uh, on uh, competition. So the competition can be attractive, but for other citizens can be desmoralizing. No, because they feel that they will not be able to win because they are few, uh, they are marginal. So it's very important not to idealize any type of participatory process, but to imagine its core, its useful core related with other typologies. And I wanted to finish on something that uh, now we are uh, facing a phase in which uh, um, technologies for operating a participatory budgeting are already there. OK, you need to expand the accessibility. But but the technologies are there. There are two, uh, two platforms, Consulate Decidin, that were created around participatory budgeting. And now they are expanding all around the world, facilitating with very low costs uh, the municipality to use this system to disambiguate uh, some decision making and also increase the quality of deliberation, not just uh, some in individual voting. So they are already uh, quite uh, evolved. Now, I don't say perfect, but uh, evol uh, there, there has been an evolution. But uh, I, I think that now we need to invest also in this mixed online offline moments because they uh, face different goals and they can obtain different results in terms of informed judgment of knowledge of uh, distribution of decision making. And my final statement is about an idea that came out uh, in the United Nations uh, uh, World Urban Forum uh, uh, three years ago in Abu Dhabi and we are still working with the networks of cities. That is about imagining participatory budgeting as a sort of uh, a important element for, for global environmental justice. In in, uh, in in which terms? If some cities of uh, the north, Europe, America, Australia, uh, could uh, allocate not only the money for their cities, but also a small amount of cooperation money, this money could go to cities of the south where the contribution to global warming is much lesser than in our cities 
in order to plan processes of uh, um, climate adaptation and mitigation, no? to mitigation to climate change uh, effects. And so this could be used as an element to create not only elements of justice uh, north south uh, uh, in a north south perspective but also uh, they could have a very important uh, aspect of uh, a pedagogic aspect uh, together with schools and with citizens in the north to understand issue that strictly relates uh, all the world as as a as a global place uh, with very unbalanced burden on on environment <clears throat> Well, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, very interesting idea as well. Um, let's uh, uh, go back one second to, to something that also you, you raised, um, the lack, uh, not only the, the lack of awareness around these tools, but also uh, the lack of diverse voices uh, um, among those who participate, uh, being um, participatory budgeting, being a very resource and time consuming process, as Elisa also mentioned. Um, it is often those uh, uh, who already are active as citizens that then uh, dedicate their time in uh, uh, for these PB processes. Um, Andrea, looking at the European level uh, again, do you think this lack of awareness um, and lack of diverse voices is also affecting other existing participatory tools? Well, lack of um, awareness, I would think, you know, in a representative democracy, we are not used to getting hands-on engaged with uh, public decision making. Um, and here we, I wonder about the state of civic education in schools and um, how much governments and education policy in general in member states support civic engagement and uh, and educating very active citizens who get engaged with policymakers and how well the, all those countries who had signed up to the open government partnership, I wish I know if I remember where the 75 countries around the world are really, um, really toe the line for their commitments they signed up for in creating a more open government culture, engaging, so be making the engagement and participation with the stakeholders and citizens a regular practice, a kind of working method in how they work in government. And this is not only um, time consuming and intensive and complicated to organize for the citizens who participate in it, it is also a challenge for um, the normal government administrations is a totally different set of skills that are needed a multidisciplinary approach connecting all the dots across uh, not only one service but several uh, where you know the the related of course to the issue at hand um, and this is um, a real but from a scientific point of view i would think you know it's interesting for me where i sit in the research and innovation service say that this is this would make a great experiment um just to see how that would work and then try pilot it across a multi uh, level government in the eu for instance but for that we need a commitment of several players so that is a uh, uh, why why people do not participate um, is it because they don't necessarily see um, where the whole thing is going to, how much influence or impact they can have with the decisions they are contributing to, and what their contribution will be used for. Much more the follow-up, I would think, people dedicating time to such um, an intensive engagement with the uh, public uh, decision-making um, will um, they want to see the results directly appear right after or soon after they had made that decision. Well, thank you. Um, Helmut, we have uh, one question from uh, the chat from our audience. Uh, it's uh, from Carla, Science for Change, Barcelona. Uh, she says, it uh, would be great to hear more um, about the fully engagement uh, of citizens uh, into the decision-making cycle and how we can strengthen our democracy from um, a bottom-up approach. So maybe you would like to quickly react to that. I mean, there are several um, uh, 
opportunities probably to, to give uh, citizens a chance really uh, to be more directly involved in the decision making. I would stress one of the preconditions and we have speak, spoken about the digitalization and the online uh, uh, forms, etc. I would say if we are regarding it from a European Union perspective, then uh, we should give the citizens really the, the, the chance to access to participation um, mechanisms, including the PB, in their mother link, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that they can discuss the question on European affairs also with citizens from other countries. And the example of the conference on the future of Europe with the online platform was quite good. So we have technologies, but we have to install them. We have to, to link these mechanisms and, and technological developments to the real process of um, enabling citizens to participate in the different questions, dialogues, um, uh, citizens, um, uh, assemblies, citizens' initiatives, etc. That must be uh, in the understanding that we create for them and with them in an inclusive way the understanding they have to 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 participate in a European um, 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 way of how we want to to shape our European Union, and I think that is a, the biggest issue. And by that, coming back also to the last remark, again we are speaking about trust and distrust, and to give citizens trust that their participation is really an added value to the questions how we are shaping, how we are deciding our European uh, um, problems and issues, then of course we will have them also uh, with us in, in an increasing participation. So maybe linking this question with the question we had just discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Helmut. Uh, I think, Giovanni, you, you want to say something as well? Uh, just a small thing, a, a small reaction. Uh, I follow it, the, the process of the, uh, the Conference of the Future of Europe, and I think the main problem of the platform was the absence of rules for using it, in the sense that uh, it was not clear what was, uh, uh, how was the relation between all the information and suggestion that people was giving through the platform and the panel of citizens. So they were not, uh, I mean, they, they it had no obligation of uh, uh, selecting things uh, from those arriving uh, from the platform. Uh, there were no rules uh, for that selection. It was more a cherry picking. So it frustrated a lot of users. So I think that uh, more than transforming the platform, we need uh, um, uh, for example, artificial intelligence can help a lot to reduce redundancy. Uh, for example, uh, clusterizing ideas which are similar on the base of uh, um, uh, tags or, 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 or text uh, uh, specific keywords uh, and help to regroup uh, into clusters because otherwise uh, uh, hundred and hundred of proposal will become unreadable by everybody and will be not possible to work on top of them. I think that this clarification of the role of the platform in the entire process is something very strategic that has to be faced for, for the future in order, in, it, because the platform could be the place for expanding you know, the, 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 the positive effect of the process from the micro publics to, uh, to the micro publics to macro publics. And instead, it acts as uh, an amplifier of frustration in many cases for all those that have been using the platform. So, this is very strategic. For me. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of uh, time, uh, but thank you so much uh, for everyone who attended this directive debate supported by Demotech. And thank you as well to all the panelists uh, for bringing in their perspective. Goodbye.